Good evening, everyone. My name is Alex. I'm with the Midtown Scholar Bookstore in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and we're delighted to be here virtually with you for this evening's program with Pamela Paul and Taffy Berdessa Ackner. Um, first, just a huge thank you to all of our viewers, attendees, customers, and everyone out there who is supporting any bookstores. The challenges continue as we ramp up for the holiday season, but we're honored to be able to offer programming like tonight's event. Um, I'd also like to give a shout out to our partnering bookstore for this evening's program, and that is Politics and Prose in Washington, D.C. But with that in mind, it's my honor to introduce our speakers here this evening. Our interviewer is Taffy Berdessa Ackner. Taffy is the New York Times bestselling author of Fleischman is in Trouble and a staff writer for the New York Times Magazine. Our featured author this evening is Pamela Paul. Pamela is the editor of the New York Times Book Review and oversees books coverage at the New York Times. She is also the host of the weekly book review podcast, and she is the author of eight books. Of course, Pamela's new book that we're here for this evening, here it is. It's titled 100 Things We've Lost to the Internet. Um, one blurb, I've got to read this one from people who write, quote, a deft blend of nostalgia, humor, and devastating insights, end quote. Uh, a couple last minute things, some quick housekeeping. If you have a question for Pamela or Taffy, please use the Q&A button towards the bottom of the screen below our faces here. We'd love to hear from you. So ask away at any point and we'll try to get to as many questions as possible towards the end of the program. Um, and most importantly, if you'd like to purchase a signed copy, here it is once again, 100 Things We've Lost to the Internet. Please visit our website at midtownscholar.com or visit Politics and Prose's website or simply look in the chat room to the right for a link. That is the number one way to support the author, the bookstore, and this event series. Again, signed copies are available at Midtown Scholar Bookstore and Politics and Prose. Um, but now, without further ado, Pamela Paul and Taffy Rodessa Ackner. Hello, everybody. Hello, Pamela. Welcome to your internet event to promote your book about how terrible the internet is. Well, it's. I would say that other than people in Silicon Valley or people who live in the backwoods, I have the same tortured, codependent, love-hate, complicated relationship with the internet probably as 98% of other people. Probably. I also think that, that you say, what's interesting is that the internet is a place where you're supposed to root for the internet and in that it's the only space right now that really exists consistently. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a book. It's like a very, it's like a strong point of view to come out, um, with right at this moment that like, actually the internet has been, it has been a mixed experience. It's given a lot of people, a lot of access to things that they didn't have before. And it's taken a lot away from us. I would like to know, um, I've known you for a while and I've, I know that this is sort of the strain of your thinking about technology. Um, I know that you're still reading your books as books uh, whenever you can. And I know um, that you are, that you, that you still have a DVD subscription service. That comes <laughs> you knew it helped me. <laughs> She's the one. She's the reason that, uh, that you can still order DVDs to your house. Um, but I would like to know what the moment was when you decided, when you thought this needs to be sort of codified. Because to me, it seems more like a, like a book that belongs in the Library of Congress, right? That like, here are, just so you know, here are the things that we lost. Well, yeah, I mean, it's true. I did plan the pandemic wrong. It was supposed to come like a year after. No, it. I did have this thought process that I think every author did, no matter what kind of book they were writing when the pandemic happened of like, oh no, what's happened to my dystopian novel about you know a cataclysmic virus or I thought it was gonna be climate change or whatever the book, it kind of forced, I think, writers to reassess where they were. And so when we first went into lockdown, I thought, well, I'm writing this largely critical, though there are some things that the internet has swiped away that, you know, I think some of us are grateful, at least some of the time. So it's not all negative. But I thought, uh oh, you know, the pandemic is really showing just how valuable the internet is. I mean, not just for me, for everyone. It gave us access to vital health information. It gave us access to the news. 
For those of us who were lucky enough to be able to work remotely, it allowed us to continue to earn a paycheck. It allowed things to function. It enabled us to get things delivered to our door, you know, sometimes the next day to order online groceries, to attend, sadly, you know, funerals um, and memorials for those who died. So the internet was quite literally a lifesaver for many people. I think as the pandemic wore on, it was interesting because then it, a little bit you know, it started to prove the point that, well, yes, the internet gives us all these things, but there is no denying that it's taking things away. Once our lives became all internet, I think anyone who had a child in their life, whether they were a parent or they were a kid or a teacher or a special ed educator or an administrator realized that the experience of attending a kindergarten Zoom, for example, or even a high school Zoom was just maybe 8% of what you got in person. And not just in terms of the education, but in terms of all of the social emotional stuff that you would get. So if you were a kid who just moved to a new town and didn't know anyone, there was no way that you were gonna like find friends to hang out with on the little, you know, Brady, Bo Brady Bunch, um, you know, array of squares. You know, you couldn't give anyone like a fun gesture, you know, you couldn't make eye contact. And for kids who are trying to develop social and emotional skills, like that was just, it was a non-experience and actually for many, you know, quite anxiety provoking. I think, frankly, not just for kids, but for all of us to be, right. to have our lives reduced to the screen. So I think weirdly the lockdown ended up proving the point. But as you said, the idea for the book stemmed from a long time before this. I think when I look at um, some of my earlier books, one of the common threads that runs throughout is looking at consumer culture, looking at products and services that are sold to us that we often buy willingly. Um, and seeing how they affect the way we conduct our daily lives. Right. And with this, what's interesting to me about technology is that with technology, like we are, we are such good consumers. We are such willing purchasers of this. Um, sometimes because it's all supposedly free, although I think that we now know it's actually not free. Right. There are many um, costs that aren't often indirect, um, but also because the message that we get from technology companies, whether it's an app producer or someone that's selling, um, you know, a suite of services to a school, the implication is that if we don't buy it, that we are somehow Luddites or holding back or resistant to change, that the problem is us. And I think that when we're buying something like a pair of jeans or we're sold something like a new sweater or an interesting eye cream, we're much more skeptical consumers. We're like, meh, I don't actually need that. Like we would, we tend to filter the message better and not to think poorly of ourselves as consumers if we opt out. And it's interesting with technology, it's kind of the opposite. So that, that intrigued me. And then the other thing, the other impetus was largely that with the internet, we are so forward looking, right? We're constantly like, wait a minute, what is this new thing? I don't know about this new thing. Does everybody else know about this new thing? You know, has everyone else downloaded this app? And what does it mean for what's going to happen tomorrow and next week? And for my kids when they graduate college, we're always just looking ahead, looking ahead. And every once in a while, we maybe pause and we're like, wait a minute. When did we all start using Venmo? When did we stop using PayPal? When did we all switch to Zelly? You know, and you sort of pause and you think like, how did we get here? But what we do a lot less frequently is stop and really look back and think to ourselves, wait a minute, like what did I do with my day before I woke up to the iPhone before I am like sat in the bathroom, like scrolling through my messages before I tried to go to sleep at night. But then I was like, I have to check one last thing. I need to just make sure one more thing. I need to see if that email arrived or if I got that Slack message, like what did our lives look before that? And that's kind of what I wanted to do with the book. Take that, that look back to kind of remember. And then for readers who weren't there, you know, for the, the Gen Z's and the millennials and the Gen, um, what else we have? Uh, I feel like we're, we're the babies, right? That <laughs> interesting to them, like they don't know, they don't know. And I actually think, and and there's some interesting, you know, signs of this that they're really curious. Like, wait, what was it like in ye old timey days? Only 20 years ago, you know, it's a lot different from the old timey days, like when you and I, Taffy, were in high school. Our parents' old timey days, or like the old timey days from the 70s and the 60s, didn't look that vastly different between ours and theirs, I mean, I remember being like, I could not believe my, my grandparents didn't have television. Like it made no sense to me. Like this, it really felt like literal dark ages, like what glowed in your room. And then, and now my, 
children can't conceive of a time where you would have to rewind a song on on a road trip like that you would delight in a song so much that you would have to listen to it again i actually think that they do not they do not delight in the song the way we did they don't have to feel feel any work for it they could just keep listening until they're done listening and then they could move on there's no acquisition there's no waiting and those are the things like the things that you're talking about are are so dopamine based right like the we're raising generations of people who are addicted to dopamine and we are maybe the last generation that remembers not being addicted to dopamine to the point where when i check my phone in the morning my like i'm so ex i need the the excitement of what happened what was i asked to do what interaction have I, have I, has been initiated for me. Right. And also what you're talking about in terms of the acquisition of things is very much about the fact that there used to be a bunch of places where we would meet. And if you were like me, you would be at a movie theater or a bookstore. And if you were like you, you would be, you know, at the gym or the horse farm, you being someone else, right? I was going to say, and what are you would, saying about me, Chucky? <laughs> I'm saying like you would, you would be able to, find, and now everyone's just in the same place. Yeah. And that is really sad to me because it takes, it does take place in this, in this one, in this one space. And the thing that the pandemic did was not, was there was not even the other, other space to fight for. What do you think? So you started trying to write this before the pandemic happened, and then you just continued. I'm so interested in that. I want to know, do you think you would have continued, you would have thought of it if the pandemic had already happened? Like, did it seem like still something that, that, that you didn't want to wait out to see, you know, how it goes? Because it's, yeah. but also, or did you, did it feel like this wistful like I want to write it down before I forget because that a lot of this I want to say one thing I see that you want to answer me but I'm going to say one thing that this is very beautifully written and this is this is a very wistful I, it's an unpopular point of view to say like you know this like look what we used to have but it is also beautiful to not hedge about it and to miss things like terrible pictures of yourselves or magazines or or missed connections or running late or being alone like it 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 filled me I, I had a lot of feelings reading it and I and I tweeted about them oh <laughs> well I, I like producing feelings with my words yeah. um so thank you yeah. I have so much to respond to on what you said I want to actually go back just a moment to the music thing there are there's a lot in this about music that yeah. you know has really changed in terms of our enjoyment like the mixtape you know remember all the work that would go into putting together a mixtape and also you knew what kind of person a person was the way they assembled their mixtape like they cut things out from magazines for the cover and they cared about the, I mean, I guess people still do when they make a playlist, but to hand somebody a mixtape and say, this is just for you. Yes. It, it basically meant you were engaged, right? Yes. Yes. It ain't the same. I mean, <laughs> the other thing is that you would, you know, it took a lot of work and dedication. You, you didn't necessarily own all the music. So sometimes you would sit there with like your hands on the play and record button, listening to the radio and being like, I hear the beginning of the song, boop, boop. And, you know, you'd press it. And then if you missed it, if it cut off poorly and it didn't make the cut for your mixtape, you just have to wait for that song to come on the radio again. Right. Like that is something that is unfathomable. But on the know. other hand, that was when we would let like whoever owned Z100, like, like Westinghouse decide what we listen to. And now one of the prices we pay is also some great gift, which is that we have access to all the different kinds of music, that, music, that it's not curated for us, that we can like wander. Like, yes. Do you think that was like, a, like, was that worth it? Well, look, there are pros and cons to it, right? Um, I think the idea of curation is really interesting and it applies to music, it applies to news, it applies to social media, it applies to magazines. So to talk about it in terms of music and, and, and a little bit more generally culturally, 
Um, on the one hand, it is good to be in charge of your own curation, but it also means that you might not necessarily be exposed to things that are outside what the algorithm is delivering to you. So while you might say like, oh, well, this DJ was curating it, um, and you kind of got to know the DJs whose tastes you liked, or the MTV VJs, or whoever it was, um, the idea that it's not really curated now, it, it, it is, it's just curated by an algorithm. And it's also curated by who's paying for promotion to have their music promoted via the algorithm. So it, it, it's still somehow curated for us. But I also think that, um, and just going over to magazines, because you mentioned that, a magazine used to be something that was deeply curated, the front of the book, the well, the back of the book, and it reflected an editor's tastes and her sort of team of editors and what they sort of thought that someone would want from a you know, a, a complete whole that was offered, whether it was on a weekly basis or a monthly basis. And that's all lost in a system where everything is kind of delivered to you bits and pieces. And you don't actually know like that this was assembled by someone who had a kind of well, overall you were thought process. order. Like the yes. pressure of boop, boop, like, of, like leading up to the big story and then coming right. down. And the really same thing is with an album, like an album was curated to listen to in a particular order with an A side and a B side. And you used to go over to your friend's house, you buy an album, you tear off the plastic, you know, and you put it on and nobody like picked up the needle to move it to like the next song. You just listen to it all the way through. I mean, later on, once you got to yeah. know, you play around a little with that needle, yeah. but, um, but you would listen to it all the way through. It was just a very different kind of listening experience. Whereas now, you know, when kids are on Spotify, they'll hear sometimes they'll even when it's a song they like they'll get like two-thirds of the way through and they'll just click forward to the next one because there's no cost to it and they're like I know the way the rest of the song goes and it actually yeah. and that's you anything about music why are you listening to music at all if you know the way the song goes right 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 um and then you know thinking about curation in terms of the news one of the things that we all lose again when we become our own curators is then we're also creating our own our own worlds in which we inhabit yeah. and that can yes deliver us the things we know and like and are interested in but it can also really limit the scope of what we're exposed to and so when i'm reading for example a broadsheet newspaper and i'm turning the pages and i know what i'm interested in something out of the corner of my eye might nonetheless attract my attention and maybe it's a story about you know water development in ethiopia that like if you had said to me this morning what would you like to read about i probably wouldn't have said well i'm really interested in water policy in ethiopia right. that wouldn't have been on my list but i see it there something in the photo or the headline or the subject captures my eye and I think you know that looks interesting and I'm drawn to it and that's what broadens our, our horizons and I think we all have the experience like as a bookish person and I'm assuming there might be some book oriented people here in this zoom um, I go onto Twitter sometimes in the morning and I'm like this is so nice everyone is tweeting about books everyone, everyone is so into the literary world. And then I realized, no, Pamela, that is because that is who you are following. You are in your own little tube. Everyone else is talking about, you know, Rihanna and NASCAR and what's going on, you know, in, uh, you know, at a climate summit. And they've all got their own other, their, their other things going on, but I've self-created this world. And even though I know that I have, it's not, it's very difficult to constantly remind yourself like, oh, right. I am only seeing these views and opinions because that is what I have asked to see. Right. Um, I wanna tell everyone who's out there um, that um, in about 10 minutes, I'm gonna start answering questions. So please send your questions ahead um, while we're on Pamela's lawn before she kicks us off of it. I'm kidding, I just wanted to make that joke. Um, so, that's really interesting. I, I do, I, I have all of these questions about, about how, how also magazines became and, and everything music um, became flatter because the world was not built for this much interaction. Like the fact that you can get feedback, the fact that we'll know right after this, how, how we did, or if one of us says something stupid, <laughs> it's just going to like, like the fact that you can't say anything stupid anymore, right? Like, um, I mean, if I want, if I, if I can add the additional hundred to the list of like the fact that you can't like try out a joke and see if it works um, without sometimes not seeing all the angles or looking stupid. I think that that has spread its kind of tentacles, that notion has spread its tentacles to sort of wanting to be the least offensive 
version of things. I'm I'm into not offending people. Like good, that's good to me to not offend things, um, to not offend people, to not be offensive. However, I do think that we have lost this, uh, that we have lost sharp points of view and that people with sharp points of view are kind of banished to this, this other region. Right. Um, well, I think what's happened is, so, you know, you have these different vacuum tubes, you know, that we're all sort of in these silos and those people whose views offend you are all in their own silo and they're perfectly happy there. They think everyone agrees with them there. It's just that yeah. you're not exposed. Or you're an, and you're an idiot. Yeah, you know, they don't have to look at you. That's the other right. thing. There's nothing happening to look at people as you talk to them. Right. Well, yes, anonymity obviously is a very un, uninhibiting. Um, I don't even think it's anonymity because it's gotten to the point where it's people who know each other. It's more that you don't have to look at the way you're hurting somebody. Like we're involved right. Right. in a room with people and, and not want them to look sad when they're talking to us. Well, one of the lost things is, of course, empathy, because it is a lot easier not yeah. to worry about how someone else feels when you actually truly don't know and you're not seeing them. All you see is, say, a Twitter handle or, you know, a name on Snapchat. You don't actually know this person. Maybe they're just a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend and none of them actually have ever met in real life. Um, but what's interesting, too, is within each of these silos, of course, there is a range of acceptable and unacceptable opinion. And then there is a middle ground where maybe it's a little bit iffy, but those unpopular opinions, which is one of the lost things, get filtered out because you're like in this space, according to the rules of this space, I know what is safe and what isn't. What I think about, you know, the fact that everyone is constantly watching, watching one another and listening, I think about that in particular, it gets hard enough for you and me, right? Like, and we're normally well-adjusted, full-grown adults, but I think about, well, am I? Um, <laughs> we're getting there, Taffy. Um, but like, I think about things that would have been utterly mortifying to me as a teenager, like walking out of the girl's room with like a piece of toilet paper stuck to the bottom of your foot, right? And so like a few people in the hallway might notice, but now what will happen is someone can videotape that they could post it to snapchat they could turn it into some kind of meme it could end up on youtube like it just keeps going on and on and while of course the internet will like forget about it maybe in an hour because someone new will do something else stupid it's still out there and it can be resurfaced and what wow. i find you know that that's interesting and i think you know the last chapter of the book is is closure which is just gone like nothing ever ends because everything can be sort of regurgitated and resurfaced at any given moment so you don't get to escape that feeling not just of being watched and observed and judged in the present but also of everything you know sort of coming back up from your past whether it is an ex-boyfriend or a silly thing you once said or a dumb joke you once told in a completely different context um it all comes back the internet comes for us all is the way my, I think of it. My dog is barking and I'm sorry. I might upset him. No one does. So everyone that's my dog. <laughs> he um I want to ask a, a strange question that, that occurred to me recently, which is about about the nature of the way the, about the nature of the internet and the way that it has hurt us a little bit in our discourse. And I was wondering what you thought of this. Do you think that the pandemic would have been shorter if there was no internet? Like, just something that occurred to me when I was reading your book. Like, do you think that not having access to each other, there maybe could have been no people who were refusing vaccine? Like, like there were, you know, any of that. Do you think yeah. that there is a universe in which us just hunkered down in our homes with just our books, with just each other, would have ended things a little bit earlier. That's too speculative for me to say. <laughs> but, you know, I do think that the, inter that, that the pandemic would have felt a lot longer if we hadn't had the internet. You know, one of the interesting things and, and what I, one of the things I tried to do in the book is for each thing that I looked at as something that is lost, I tried to think of, well, for me right now, this feels like a loss but sometimes maybe it's kind of a gain. And maybe for some other person who's coming at this from a completely different experience is sees it as a gain. So yeah. one of the things is 
feeling like the only one, right? So in general, you would say, it's good not to feel like you're the only one, right? It's generally, it's good to feel like, you know what? Like if my child has a rare genetic disorder, if my husband is suffering from a debilitating condition, if I am dealing with this particularly thorny work problem, um, if I, you know, am contemplating my gender identity and I live in a small rural community where I don't know anyone else like through this and like then it's all good right you can reach out you can find someone else online who finds you know who will validate your point of view who you can communicate with and commune with and that is also good but then again kind of turning that like well let's look at it from this angle so being the only one also can kind of feel like you're not that special you know like you might think that you have this really cool you know, hobby, which is disassembling old watches, taking the parts, turning them into collages, spray painting them, mounting them on like a big poster board and hanging them around your house. You'll go online and you'll find out there are actually dozens, maybe hundreds of people who do that exact same thing. They do it better than you. They've been doing it longer than you and they're more well-known and you may as well just lay down your hat, you know, your, your sort of cap right now and give it up. So that's a kind of negative way. And then again, being a little less serious, a little more serious here, like the internet can also validate really unhealthy behaviors, right? So there's been obviously with all the the uh, revelations around Facebook and Instagram and the effects that it has on adolescent girls in particular, a lot about body image and eating disorders. And there are places to go where if you are um, a child at risk of anorexia or bulimia, it's perfectly fine there. It's perfectly acceptable to certain communities that do that online. And so you will feel like, oh, maybe it's okay. Cause all these other people here are doing it and they're all saying it's okay. And they're validating that experience. So for each of these things, you know, there's kind of there's just different ways to look at it. So some of the, some of the losses are also gains and and vice versa. I mean, it's like anything else. It's good. It's bad. It's terrible. It's not great, but it's so it's fine. Um, (laughs) I I like to run in like a fun slash depressing lean, generally speaking. So it's always both. I mean, I don't think of this book as depressing. Like I think that I, you know, I can make a lot of like get off my lawn jokes, but it really is like a, it's a book about, about the changing of an era. And I, there, the throngs of people who are here have questions for you um, because I've gotten to ask mine. Um, everyone has gotten to see what it's like to be in a room with us when we're alone, which is we just talk too fast at, at each other um, and never get to the end of any of them. <laughs> um, but here, it, here, are some, here are some really great questions. Um, Julia asks, um, what, are, what is your, how do you explain to your children um, how do you make sense of what it was like for us? Like, I'm sure that you have to discuss with your children all the time. This is not how we used to do it. Like what, what, what are the highlights you bring to them? Well, it's funny. I'm going to, I'm going to give you a non-internet technology story that happened relatively recently. So, um, we have a car and we have a number of sets of keys to the car and we just generally don't always know where those keys are. So I, at one point, um, a few months ago, I took the key of despair, which is like the one you get from the dealer that doesn't have the fob on it. You know, it's just a little Mm -hmm. ring with a key and I brought it out to, to the car and I opened up the door with the key. And my daughter who is 16 was like, you can open up a car with a key. (laughs) <laughs> and, you know, and like it, it's that like level of obviousness that I feel like applies to so much of pre-internet right. life right. you know like we have so my kids I think generally know my sort of nostalgic slash you know um my, my nostalgic temperament and I am you know a, a, a storyteller sort of, of of habit so I'm constantly saying like olden days, you know, mm-hmm. just as my father once did to me, although not about stickball in Brooklyn. So, you know, we have in the, in the kitchen, we have an old fashioned kitchen phone that has a cord and it actually doesn't really work that well. So it's sort of proving the it's obsolescence. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's really crazy for kids to realize that that's what you used to, that was your, cho- that was your only choice. You know, that was all you've had. If you wanted privacy, you tried like how to get that thing into the bathroom or to like go into like a little corner and like talk like this into the receiver. Um, And, you know, and when you think about it, you know, I'm not quite answering this person's question, but like what I tried to do with this book is like, then remember all the little things about it. So like, this is gross, but that, that, that cord was really fun to chew on. Super dangerous. I don't recommend it, but like, you know, 
Did you not show well, the board? I'm sure the board. on it, but you're right. Like, I'm remembering. That's a terrible idea. It's a, right. It was a chew toy. It was a terrible idea. Right and now. also it would get so tangled. Remember how like the coils were all to go this way, but somehow but sometimes they would, it would go the other way. And then you'd be like on the phone. And while you were on the phone, you'd fiddle with it and try to like, under, it's just all those little details. Um, and then to directly answer your question, um, my two kids uh, who are here have both read the book. <laughs> uh -huh. So they're like, oh, wow. Oh, yeah. Um, now we understand you a little bit slightly okay, better. So the answer is to buy this book for your child, Julia, um, and all of your children. Um, someone wants to know how you organize your bookshelves, which I think is a way of saying do you organize your bookshelves? No, what a mess it is back there, right? Um, my books are so poorly organized. Um, but you know, okay, this actually comes to a point in the book, which is that now that so many of our things are digitally organized, uh -huh. we have, I think we are losing the ability to, like most of us as human beings have a kind of um, spatial relation and visual brain. And so for me, these are in no order whatsoever. Um, uh, there's some small pockets of order, like you might see there's like New York Review of Books in one place, and there's like Penguin Classic drop cases in one place. But generally speaking, there are no order yet in my brain, I know where I saw a book last. And so, yeah. and, and this is my, this is my bedroom bookshelf behind us. Uh, but then I have my office bookshelf and I have the living room bookshelf and we have the kitchen bookshelf. There are bookshelves, obviously it's a problem, an occupational hazard all over the place. And I have a kind of space knowledge. And, and what's funny is my kids too don't order their books, but they have a vague order. And when I go in there and try to like reshelve things, they get really angry. Of course they do. As they should. <laughs> um, this question is for both of us. Do we have a favorite nostalgic thing that we've lost to the internet that we wish would make a comeback? You go first. Oh my God. Okay. Mine cannot make a comeback. I'm going to come up with something existential, which is that... I really, really miss, I'm not very good with meditation and all those kinds of healthy ways of thinking. I really miss being able to be in the place that I am, like even without meditating, just at one time without, you know, constantly thinking about the other things that are happening yeah. in my space at that same time. Like I live permanently with 21 tabs open on two different computers plus my phone. And yeah. it's really hard for me to, to focus I think probably a lot of people have experienced the feeling and they've actually, you know, been studies that show that if you read, for example, with your phone in the room, you're going to have a harder time. Even if that phone, even if you're not checking it, yeah. it's very presence because it's essentially saying, while you were trying to get lost in here within these pages, there's these other stories happening over here and just that knowledge. And like, done here's everything. Here's your book and here's everything. And how can you expect like a well-evolved brain to just choose the book? Right. Well, our brains are still not, look, if our bodies are still trying to catch up with processed food and it's been like, you know, a long time, it's yeah. been decades since we've had this stuff. Think about our brains. Like we are not yet caught up with how to process all this. Like we've picked up many, many habits that yeah. on, a, on a sort of surface level, we now all think in this way, this internet -y way. But I think that there is a kind of lag with our, like our deeper brain and our body where it's like, hold on just a moment. Um, and it's very hard. I also think emotionally, um, I don't think that we've caught up, but, but you share your more fun, nostalgic thing. It's not, I, mean, I miss being around. able to run away. I miss being able to go to like Europe or, um, Ohio and like not know what you're doing and get a little bit lost and disappear I really miss disappearing like I went into you know we're, we're not discussing our day jobs but I went into magazine journalism because I like to sometimes leave and now I never leave I was in Russia getting calls about homework for my like it's just a different experience of what you're like how you're allowed to exist I think what we're saying is that is the same thing I do miss I do miss telephones, like not phones, telephones. And I miss the- Well, these are not phones. These are portable internets. Like yeah, the fact we like, call yeah. it a phone is so ludicrous. I mean, I remember watching the Jetsons and this is what they would do. They're like, it's like a computer telephone. It's crazy. Um, I miss, I really miss being able to, I miss 
the way your time was spoken for, which by the way, changed when voicemail came along, right? Like, like if you couldn't get me, you didn't get me. And now we imagine that there's so much more time and there's so much more that's expected of us. Like our metabolism for information is so much higher. And I, I, I really miss that. I also miss um, movies. I, I miss the way movies have changed as a result of the internet and like a sort of intolerance for just a weird movie that you might walk into or a sneak preview or not having every minute planned. But this isn't about me. This yeah, is no, I think, you know, one of the things that's lost is serendipity and mystery. Yeah. And, and one of the things, just speaking of, mo- of, of watching a movie is like trying to figure out who the actor is. Like, is that Dan Hedaya or is that David Paymer? Like character actors, now we know every single Law & Order episode. They, they have a story in, in Vulture. <laughs> <laughs> they got like a big story in Vulture. Um, Justine asks a great, great question. Um, oh, by the way, that was from Jenna. Thank you. From, thank you, Jenna. Justine asks, um, so vinyl records have made a comeback with millennials. Um, do, you, do you think that there will be some sort of rejection of all of this? Like I do, I on some level, like my children look at my life and they're like, there has to be something better than this. <laughs> they'll be able to, to cultivate or, or if they'll always be like the last person who got, who, who didn't have a cell phone and ruined everything for everyone because how do you make a play date for your kids if you don't have, like, that's what I would like to know. And that's what Justine would like to know. So I, yes, Justine, I think what's interesting is you're seeing two different kinds of comebacks. Some are among the people um, of, of my age demographic who are like, I miss this thing that we used to have like vinyl records. But what I think is even more interesting is as Taffy pointed out, the kids, they are buying vinyl. Like you go into your average sort of teenager friendly mall shop and they're selling little turntables there. Um, and Polaroid cameras are hugely popular. There's this app called Dispo that tries to simulate the experience of film in that it won't show you what you've seen until 9 a.m. the next morning. Now, what's funny is like, remember the days when you actually, before 24 hour photo oh, 9 a.m., that's, that's so speed. I know. <laughs> right. But that's very, very long for the for the young folk. Um, I do think so. I think that, you know, there there is a kind of fetishizing of um, office products. I mean, not to the extent that there was in the 80s. So for those who were of that, you know, sort of tween demographic in the 80s, if you remember stationery stores and sticker stores and just the sheer glory of like all of those stickers and the glitter pens and the it different smelled, Some of them smelled books. and just you would buy a pen that looked like a lollipop for no reason. Yes, yes. He loved it. Stickers. He loved it. <laughs> puffy stickers and scratch and sniffs. And so all those kind of things are making like little micro comebacks. And I think that that does speak to both a nostalgia on the part of the olds of which I am one. Um, and then also this kind of curious, like nostalgia for the world that once was, you know, it was like the, the equivalent in the eighties of watching when Peggy Sue got married. It's like, what was it like in the olden times? That's so interesting. So do you, but do you, do you like, I think what Justine is really asking is like, do you think they're might be some kind of real sea change rejection of all of this to the point where maybe like I have a fifth grade, I have a sixth grader who has to email all the time his teachers. Like, and by the way, his poor teachers who can't go home from from I feel so bad for those teachers. I do too, but I'm also like he's like a little executive. He's like me. He's answering, he's answering emails all day. Like, do you think there will be a point where people just say like away with the smartphone, away with, away with social media, like, you know, again, it's, 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 I'm not very good at predicting the future. I'm better at dwelling on the past, but I think that, you know, these are very powerful companies. Um, These are um, systems that have a very deep and like tight stronghold on our institutions. Um, the ways in which the technology industry, for example, has infiltrated schools is very tenacious. And what are they doing, really? It's customer acquisition. It's like any yeah. company, whether the they're selling, right, whether they're selling cereal or detergent, they're trying to imprint at the earliest age their brand. 
and a reliance of brand loyalty on customers. So that is why, for example, Google sells really cheap Chromebooks into schools at the district level and persuades them to adopt a tech-friendly curriculum. And you know, this is all done under the guise of, well, this is to impart 21st century skills. Now that sounds good. And to a certain extent, it is certainly true. On the other hand, 21st century skills could mean many things. It could mean environmental conservation and, 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 and um, you know, combating climate change. It could mean healthcare and in particular elder care. It could mean mental health. And yet none of those fields have overtaken the school curriculum to the point that children are learning like nursing skills um, right. in grade school rather than getting iPads in kindergarten. So like whether there will be a sea change on that level, I don't know, because I think, you know, this is a very big industry and it is very entrenched at this point. Oh my God, that's so depressing. You're right. You're right. Um, Jeff would like to know if there's anything that didn't make the hundred list. I'm always suspicious. Jeff, I agree. I'm suspicious around numbers. <laughs> did you have to get to a, like, did you have like 97 great ones and you're like, I'm just going to go for a uh, for 100 or did you have 102 great ones and you had to kill a couple of your darn things? So I think I started my original list was like 212 and it went down to 168. And then, you know, what I tried to do and really each list, each chapter in this book it has one chapter title and yet often it contains many things because of course, when you think about something like the Rolodex, you're also talking about all these other desk items like whiteout, like staple removers, yeah. like, um, you know, they're, they're just a lot of paper-based products that all then fall within that, that chapter. Right. So, um, so I, I sort of tried to get them into kind of general categories, but there are definitely more than 100. Um, and so, I tried to get what was it. your favorite and, one that you lost? One like that I'm happy that's gone? No, one that, well, maybe. I'll tell you something I'm happy that's one gone. that you really, that you're like, no, one one that didn't make the list that you're like, ah. oh, should have, should have. Well, you came up with one during our pre-Zoom, which was borders, which I think is- Borders. Is borders and boundaries, boundaries. I mean, I get at this a little bit in, in, in the book, but there's this sort of, you know, apocalyptic sounding, again, depending on your point of view, maybe it sounds jolly to you, but there's something that Mark Zuckerberg said early on in Facebook days, in which he said, like, in the future, there will be no, like, personal you and no work life you and no, you know, in other words, you're not all these different selves, like, you're just one self, and you must present at the same time, the same thing to all people. And like, for people who go like, you know, here, a little baby cutie to their one year old, like, that's very scary, you know, you don't really want to talk like that to your boss. So the idea of like the obliteration of all these boundaries between like, what is appropriate in one venue, versus another venue, I actually think is kind of scary. But I'm going to answer the question that you tried to ask, but didn't quite, which is something I'm happy that's 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 gone is yeah. losing the ticket. Because wow, did I lose tickets? I mean, you cannot lose your plane ticket. You cannot yeah. lose your train ticket, your concert ticket, your metro car. Like you now have it on your phone. Of course, you can lose your phone. <laughs> Do you know? I don't know anyone who loses their phone. I mean, I spent an hour this afternoon not knowing where my 13 year old was, but I knew where my phone was. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, Sam would like to know. Um, can you speak to what the book, how the book industry changed before the internet and how, like, is the book industry better or worse? Which I think is a loaded good question because there are a lot of people whose work we're seeing that I don't think we would have. And then there's also, it, feel, it feels like everything has been flimsified a little bit. And, you know, the, I, you, you answer this. I could write a book about that <laughs> to answer that question. Right. Um, so I'm going to say it really depends on where you're coming from, whether right. you see it as better or worse. I would say that for the independent bookstore, even for the retail bookstore chain, the, the internet has been a kind of devastating impact, it had a devastating impact. It's not to say that great bookstores like Midtown Scholar and Politics and Prose are not surviving and thriving, but the um, it's been hard. It's hard to compete with an online retailer um, right. that offers lower prices, right. faster delivery, wider selection. I would say if you are a, an author, an aspiring author, 
it can be great. If you're happy to be self-published, it's so much faster and easier to do that. You don't even have to print copies of your books because they can be eBooks. So it's much easier to get your voice out there if you're an author and you don't go through an established publishing house. Um, and, you know, I would say that, well, those are two examples. Well, I, <laughs> um, I, remember I would also say actually one more thing. Um, I think that the, the internet, um, the internet has made audiobooks much more easily and widely available. And again, to just look at this from another perspective, for someone suffer who has dyslexia, audiobooks are a much easier way to enjoy a good story. And yeah. you have access online to yeah. any number of audiobooks. So again, for those people, it's a bonanza. So it really does depend on, on where you're coming from. Right. I, I mean, I also remember that there was a conversation a few years ago about um, the, not the politics, the sort of tastes around using, using the internet to promote your book. Um, like, like we are now, but before, before there were Zoom, because we didn't do this a few years ago, um, like tweeting and, and all of that. And I do think that like what people don't take into account is that a lot of writers don't have the, like, do not have the, um, the per like they don't have a, the personality that wants to do that, that wants to be a public figure with a, with a handle. Um, and that for those people, it was a lot easier when there were, um, there's just a system of, of gatekeeping, but also that those gates kept a lot of people out. So yeah, I'll You're say right. one thing about you gatekeeping. Write a book about this. This should be yeah. a nice book. <laughs> I mean, I totally agree with you. Like it, it, it can, it, it can feel like a lot of work and it can feel difficult. And for those who are shy or retiring or private, it's hard to come, you know, to, to be out there, but here's one positive side. Like mm -hmm. Judy Bloom is on Twitter. If you are a kid reading Judy Bloom, you can oh tweet God. at her. And, and what she if she doesn't answer gone. you? Well, but she can, and you can go, if you're a kid who loves, you know, Wings of Fire, um, you can go on to the fan website. You could find other kids who love that series too. You can see, like you can, you can enter into chat rooms with them. So there are lots of ways that I think, you know, the ways in which the internet democratizes, mm -hmm. not just writing, but also the enjoyment of writing. And so right. that again, is a, is a positive thing. Um, well, this has been absolutely wonderful. Everybody, this is like, this is a great book. It is a great book um, to lose yourself in. It's a great historical document. Um, Alex is here to kick us off of Pamela's lawn. Um, but in the meantime, I want to say that I really enjoyed this book. And I loved talking to you about this. When's the last time we got a full hour to talk, Pamela? I know, I know. And I also want to say just in support of Midtown Scholar Bookstore and Politics and Prose that they have signed copies on hand. Um, wonderful, independent local bookstores for you to get this book and other books and Taffy's books from. So please do. Thank you. Thanks, Pamela. Thanks, Taffy. This is an incredible conversation. Thank you to our audience member. Thanks for everyone for tuning in. Once again, as Pamela was saying, 100 things we lost to the internet. We both have signed copies. So look in the chat room or simply hit up our websites or visit us in store. Um, and thanks again. Everyone have a good night. Thank you so Bye. much. Bye. Thank you.